What's good team? Welcome to another Small James Coding tutorial where today we're going to be talking about network requests. Everything and anything you could possibly want to know. The ultimate crash course on network requests, HTTP, REST methods, IP addresses, domains, URLs, just about everything you could need to know. So sit tight, buckle up and let's learn some more. So we're going to start off talking about what a network request actually is. And a clinical definition is a network request communicates information between two or more pieces of hardware. So the most common example of a network request is a client and a server. So for example, when someone goes onto Google and types in www.google.com, the client is their operating machine. So their computer, specifically their browser is executing code on the client's machine. And that communicates with the server, which will be Google's server, and then Google may respond. So the client might create a get network request to Google, it reaches Google, and then Google responds with a whole lot of information. Most network requests are associated with a protocol. So in this particular case, a lot of them are HTTP or HTTPS. I'm sure that sounds pretty familiar. And that just stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, where the S on the HTTPS just means secure. So there we go, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And these are the primary protocols for communication and data transfer between a web client and a web server. So just as I mentioned before, someone goes onto their computer, that's their web client, their browser, and they communicate with the web server, which is some kind of hardware that is running in Google's physical servers. So most network requests reach a port at a particular domain and often HTTP and HTTP S requests are differentiated by the ports that they reach. So for example, HTTP typically associates with port 80 and HTTPS typically associates with port 443. So that nicely leads us into IP addresses and ports. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a client running the browser on their machine and that makes a network request to a server. Now that network request locates the server by the IP address where an IP address identifies a machine or server in an IP network. So all public servers are identified by an IP address and this determines the destination of our data packet where the data packet can take a whole lot of different forms, contain all sorts of different metadata and more. Now the port is basically like a subsection of the particular server. So the IP address maps to a machine or a server and then the port identifies a particular application or service on a system and that's within a server. Now ports are typically associated with different numbers so as I mentioned earlier HTTP is associated with port 80 and HTTPS is typically associated with port 443. Now these are both ports open within the same IP address so the same server so collectively we can have a server that is listening to external requests, an external request reaches the server and then is directed to a particular port where a whole lot of different processes can happen and then a response is generated back to the client machine. So similar to the concept of IP addresses, you know, your local IP address is something like 127.0.0.1. That means a lot of nothing to a typical human being, whereas most people are much more familiar with something known as a URL. So a URL is an acronym that stands for Universal Resource Locator. So it's analogous to the IP address. A URL is typically mapped to an IP address through a system called a domain naming system. But essentially the URL is this entire block here. So this entire thing is the URL. Here we go to Instagram slash a particular account and the domain is a subsection of the URL. So the domain is specifically associated to the IP address through the domain naming system, which is the DNS. So domain is essentially just a part of a URL where these extra parts mean different things. This is the protocol and these are often known as the query parameters and or paths. So now we know that we can get to a particular service that is identified by an IP address and we can get to that IP address from a domain or a URL. So we type in the URL, we send a network request to that IP address, that particular server, and then a port within that server. From there, we get to something known as REST design and HTTP or HTTPS methods. Now here we have five methods. There's a number of them, but five of the most common methods. And once we get to a particular URL, which is the domain and the path that follows it, 
we can then go to any of these particular methods to execute a certain body of logic on the server. So for example, a get is a very common HTTP method. Every time you type in a web address into Google, for example, or the URL bar, that sends a get network request to a server. For example, you type in www.instagram.com, that sends a get request to Instagram. And once we've navigated to that IP address, that URL, that particular port, we go to the get block of logic and that often responds with an HTML document. So the get logic coded into Instagram servers at that specific path responds with some information that our browser can then process and often display on our screen. Now get is the most common HTTP method and also often the simplest. It literally is just an ask for information, give get me information. Then we have post, put and patch and all of these differ from a get request because suddenly they send information from the client to the server and then the server responds with some kind of message you know perhaps that's saying success or it's saying that was a failure or any other type of information so if these three http methods send information then what's the difference well a post is typically used specifically for creating a child resource a put is specifically for creating or replacing the resource and a patch is to update part of the resource if it already exists so we send information and dependent on the functionality that we want to do, we modify the type of network request that we're creating to send to that particular URL. Now, finally, we have a delete. A delete is obviously to delete the target resource, remove the package. And so all of this logic is getting executed on the server and is often initiated from the client's machine or your particular or your browser that you have open on your laptop where your browser just initializes the network request that reaches the server, the server executes that body of logic and then responds with the outcome of that. So here's an example of a request response cycle in total. We start off generating a network request to a particular port of a server that is located by its IP address. Equally, it could also be located by its URL. The port then identifies a connection endpoint. So if you think as the server as the hardware, the port just more specifically navigates us to a connection endpoint, or another way of thinking of that is it directs the data to a specific service within the server. After that, the hypertext transfer protocol method determines the action to occur at that service. So we get to a service that might handle a user login. The method might specify whether or not we're deleting that login, creating the login or updating the login. And so the server would then execute code dependent on the HTTP method. So as I just mentioned, we would potentially create, update or delete that user. And then after that body of logic has happened, the server then responds to the client where the client is uh, potentially the web browser with a status code, which is required and potentially also a data response. Now status codes is something that we'll get into very shortly, but the data is an optional part. So, you know, that could be JSON, that could be a file, that could be a redirection link. And it's essentially just in the same way that your, your browser can send information as part of a network request to a server. The server can also send information back to the browser. And then finally, the browser receives the response and the network request is fulfilled. So this is the end. All of the logic has been executed and our browser will then know the outcome of that entire process. So if we move on to focus specifically on status codes, status codes are how our browser interprets the outcome of that network request. So we often get them in hundred levels. So for example, you get status codes in the 100s, 200s, 300s, 400s, and 500s. The most common ones are typically at 200s and 400s where status codes in the 100 to 199 range are typically informational. 200 to 209 means that the request was successful. Everything operated as it should and we have a correct outcome. 300 means that the client is redirected to a different resource. So that basically says that we've gone to the server and the server has responded saying go somewhere else. 400 means that the request contains some kind of error. So for example, if we get a 404, that means that we couldn't find the server. And typically 400 means that it's actually an issue in the first half of the network request, which is from your browser to the server. Something went wrong. So as I mentioned, 404 means that we haven't found the server. 403 means that we've gotten to the server, but we've been forbidden to access any of the information. 
so on and so forth. There are a number of them, but 404 and 403 are the most common. And then 500 means that we have successfully reached the server. We've reached the body of code that we wanted to reach. However, there was an error while the server was executing that body of code. And consequently, we've had an unsuccessful network request and the server broke somewhere. So the server would respond with a 500 level status code and we would know that something went wrong on the server once we got there. Now, things like the HTTP method, the status code, and a number of other things are often encoded into what's known as the header or the headers of the request. So an HTTP method is a field of an HTTP request or response that passes additional context and metadata about the request or response. So often another example is content type. So for example, if we were sending JSON, we would specify in the header of the document that the package contained within the request is JSON. And then the server knows how to pass that information because it's informed in the headers that the content type expected in the package is JSON. Another example might be an authorization token. So as I mentioned earlier, if we get a 403 response from the server, that means our network request was unauthorized. And so what we can do is we can add an authorization token or an identification token to our request and then the server will read that authorization token from the header and consequently we might have access to that body of logic and hopefully we would get a 200 level response and finally the http method which specifies which service we're getting within a port in a server and that could be one of the five that i mentioned earlier or others you know most commonly it's a get request sometimes we might specify that we're posting information instead of just asking for information in a get request or we might be deleting information. So here is an example of how we might construct a network request. Let's say we're sending a get request to instagram.com slash login. So login is the path or route that we want to go to within this domain. This entire thing is the URL. We get a response of 200, a response status code. So that means that we've successfully gone to the server. The server has executed some kind of logic and responds with HTML. The HTML then gets rendered on our page and we can type in our login and user information. When we click the login button, suddenly what we're doing is constructing a post request to that same URL. As the method is different, we get navigated to a different body of logic that handles information that is in the contents of the network request. So where in the first instance, we don't have any contents to our original network request, but the server responds with contents, which is the HTML. In the second example, we now send the contents, which is the user, and that might be the username or the email and the password. We now send that in the original network request to the server. The server successfully receives that. We don't get a 403, which means we're authenticated, and we get a response status code of 300, which then might redirect us to the home page of our particular account. So in this post example, we would probably send this contents or this user information inside of JSON. And in the header of the request, we would specify that the content type is JSON and that the method is a post request. So here, once again, the 300 level response code means that we're getting a redirection URL as a response. And ultimately, that's pretty much it. That's the entire cycle Web development is just a series of network requests that communicate different machines operating different bodies of code. Ultimately, everything is a server, so any network request connects two servers that are just units of hardware operating code. In the most common example, we have the client, which is operating the browser, and the browser often is executing JavaScript. And on the server, that's just a different set of hardware that is set up to listen to incoming requests execute logic, it's basically just a runtime, and then respond to whoever is creating the request. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and sub, super appreciated. If you like this kind of tutorial, let me know what you'd like me to do down below next in the comments, and I will give that a shot, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.